Hi, my name is Nicholas Grimes. I'm an anaesthetist in Melbourne, Australia. My name is Peter Fritz and I'm an emergency medicine and retrieval specialist in Australia. This presentation on the airway safety lines is intended to give a visual representation of the timeline of some of the issues involved in difficult airway management. It's important to note that the airway safety lines diagram is intended for educational purposes. It's not intended to be a cognitive aid for use in clinical practice. Airway management inherently involves the risk of interrupting oxygen delivery to the alveoli. The time available until critical desaturation occurs, however, is only known retrospectively. It depends on many factors, such as the age of the patient, their size, their current illness and comorbidities. Our aim in airway management is to establish oxygenation by a non-surgical airway technique prior to critical desaturation occurring. Once again, the time required until a non-surgical airway can be established is unknown. The overlap between the time to critical desaturation and the establishment of a non-surgical airway along this timeline represents the margin of safety for airway management. Because both of these times are unknown prospectively, the margin of safety is theoretical and can't be assigned a value. Though depending on the clinical circumstances, there may be situations in which we can expect the margin of safety to be widened or narrowed in a given patient. In order to increase our margin of safety and thereby prevent hypoxia, there are a number of specific actions that can prolong our time to critical desaturation as well as improving our efficiency in establishing a non-surgical airway, which will provide our patient with a greater margin of safety. We know there are also clinical factors which can decrease the time to critical desaturation and which can impede early establishment of a non-surgical airway, decreasing the margin of safety, or in extreme cases, eliminating it entirely and exposing the patient to the risks of critical hypoxia. To avoid this, an emergency surgical airway is required to bridge the gap in the airway safety lines. Therefore, there are three separate, interrelated and equally important aspects to the safe care of the patient with a difficult airway. Maximising the time to critical desaturation. Efficiently establishing a non-surgical airway as early as possible. And recognising the need for and having the ability to efficiently perform an emergency surgical airway where required. So how do we increase our time to critical desaturation? There's been much written and spoken about these techniques in the past few years, especially by Scott Weingart and Richard Levitan. Pre-oxygenation would be the technique with which clinicians would be most familiar. Essentially, we need to maximise our pre-oxygenation with CPAP or PEEP. Even during rapid sequence induction, gentle mask ventilation whilst waiting for muscle relaxants to take effect is now widely accepted to be a safe technique, providing excessive airway pressures are avoided. Using nasal prong oxygen during our intubation is a vitally important way of increasing our time to critical desaturation. Placing the obese patient in an anti-Trendelenburg or head-up position will increase their functional residual capacity, thus prolonging their desaturation time. The choice of muscle relaxant and the use of adjuvant drugs during intubation has been shown to have a significant effect on the time to critical desaturation presumably by modifying the oxygen consumption associated with fasciculations. To facilitate efficiently establishing a non-surgical airway, we advocate the Vortex approach, which is outlined in detail in another presentation and in our electronic article. We believe this high-stakes cognitive tool is vital in both the preparation phase of airway management as well as during the airway establishment phase. The approach encourages the airway operator to have an optimal attempt at each of the three non-surgical techniques, utilising the five generic optimization strategies. The Vortex approach also has an important role in facilitating the recognition of the need for an emergency surgical airway where optimal attempts at each of the non-surgical techniques have been unsuccessful. Once the need for an emergency surgical airway has been identified, we advocate using the techniques outlined by Andrew Hurd and his team at the Royal Perth Hospital. In short, a needle technique is usually the best initial approach for critically care trained clinicians. First attempt should be with a percutaneous or closed approach. If this is unsuccessful, then the problems are thought to arise from difficulty identifying airway anatomy. Then dissection down until the laryngeal structures are more easily identifiable is recommended on the second attempt. 
Conversely, if a needle technique fails despite clear identification of airway landmarks, then the second attempt should be with a scalpel and bougie technique. Scalpel cricrothyroidotomy is also an accepted first line technique in situations where the person performing the procedure is more familiar with that technique. So in summary, we want to use as many of the above techniques to increase our time to critical desaturation whilst facilitating our establishment of a non-surgical airway. This increases our margin of safety and thereby prevents our patients from suffering morbidity and mortality from hypoxia. A comprehensive difficult airway training program ensuring delivery of the content in these three areas to all critically care trained staff in Southern Health, as well as universal access to the equipment required to carry them out across any area where airway management might be undertaken, is being implemented in Southern Health this year. This program, known as the Monash Strategy, will be the subject of a future presentation.